Ah, okay. All right. Then. I won't, I won't keep it long because I, I would be really interested to hear um, others' opinions. And just in the chat we just had, uh, I mean, I think we already started a, a really interesting discussion about alienation. So we'll be happy to, to listen and then contribute. Um, my name is Bram Buescher. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, the Sociology of Development and Change or Development Sociology at Wageningen University here in the Netherlands. But I've uh, been associated with the University of Johannesburg and Stellenbosch University for uh, quite a long time now, uh, since about 2008 with, uh, with the UJ. Um, and I've done most of my own work um, in South Africa, which yeah, has become really a second home. Uh, part of my family is from, from South Africa. So I'm really happy to be here and to, to, to hear these discussions. And I think that they're incredibly important. So um, again, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, Kelly asked me to reflect a little bit on how I see economics in my, in my work and, um, and how I would then look at, you know, some elements around uh, conserving nature or the conservation of biodiversity. Um, but maybe very, very briefly, most of my research so far has been on the link between yeah, environment and, and development in, in a very broad sense. I always find it a little bit difficult to explain what I'm, what I'm really interested in or doing, but I've tried to study the relations between you know, development and environment from different perspectives. So my, my PhD, was on uh, transboundary conservation areas in Southern Africa, uh, looking particularly at the relation between Lesotho and KwaZulu-Natal, but also others. I've also looked at the relation between oil and, and fossil fuel extraction and conservation. Um, I did a study on the link between social media and, and nature. Um, so looking at how social media changes our relationship to, to nature. And more recently, I've done work on uh, together with uh, several PhD students and others on uh, the increasing militarization of conservation, particularly after the, or in relation to the rhino poaching crisis in, in South Africa, uh, mainly around the Kruger National Park, but also other places. So those are some of the projects that I've, that I've done, but the core central interest within that has always been to understand environment and, and capitalism. So my theoretical work is all about yeah, the relation between um, development environment and, and capitalism uh, from a more historical to more recent uh, perspective. And this is then, uh, then I will zoom in on, on, on economics. This is also how I look at economics. Um, I've had several introductory courses on economics myself and um, felt that that was not really for me. Um, I was much more interested in, in, in politics, but I've come to sort of review that a little bit. And now my approach to economics is basically political economy, how economic issues like the distribution of goods and services or labor issues are always attached to political issues around interests that people have or actors or, um, or uh, organizations or states, et cetera. So um, from that perspective, and also from kind of different different disciplinary angles, including anthropology and geography, uh, but also political science um, and sociology, I can try to um, broaden an understanding of political economy, basically by incorporating three main things. And, and this is something I've, I've only found out quite recently, or I think I've done this for quite a while, but this has become more important to me over the last years as I've tried to more, to explicate this more and it means that, that that three things for me are really important that I feel classical economics uh, does not do uh, namely to take into account history context and positionality so history context and positionality um, history I think is incredibly important in so many ways and I've come to make come to appreciate it more and more as I as I continue to, 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 yeah, to progress my work. Um, you know, the, the history of capitalism and, and the relation between uh, development and capitalism 
is incredibly fascinating and I'm, I'm still sort of discovering things in there that help me understand the moment that, that we are currently in. Uh, but it's also important to highlight why and how our economic system and our view of economics as a discipline has become what it has become. Um, just to give you an ex just a very straightforward kind of illustration, and I'm sure you, maybe you already discussed this. I'm sorry that I wasn't there for the previous discussions. So I hope I don't uh, um, repeat too many things. But one of the key central, yeah, things for me that, that I have come to, come to comprehend over the last years is also how capitalism has changed and influenced um, academic thinking and universities more, more generally um, to be more output driven, to, to, to be completely neoliberalized, to be focused on rankings, uh, comparing things to make academic labor, you know, a commodity, but also how it changed disciplines and how it drove disciplines apart, right? So when you study conservation issues about 100 years ago, um, economic issues, political issues were not separated from natural science issues or religious issues or other contextual social issues. Uh, not nearly as much as, as we see this now. I think this really hampered the economics discipline. So it's, be, it, it's become very good at a certain kind of thing. It's basically, I would say it's basically the, um, the official discipline uh, for, for capitalism, you know, how to, how to make, you know, economics within capitalism uh, function more um, um, smoothly uh, by leaving out all kinds of contexts, histories, and the positionalities of people. Um, so context relates to the political context, you know, what, what's happening, right? For example, I mean, people come up with good policy advices, but if, if somebody like Trump is in power or uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, or others, I mean, it's clear that a certain type of, you know, instrumental policy advice will fall flat in, in the face of those kind of contexts. Uh, and thirdly, positionality comes from more my anthropological sort of leanings that, that you can point to how, how economics as a process should be. Should, should be. Um, but if you don't take, it, take into account how different people from their own histories and from their own context, and as was mentioned just now, from their own lived experience, enter into the labor process, enter into uh, economic uh, transactions, enter into um, uh, all kinds of broader markets and trade issues, then it, you know, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to a lot of people and or connect well with their life worlds. And so I would just basically want to reiterate what was just said about, about you know, lived experiences and, and people's life worlds and how important it is. Uh, but at the same time, I think you can bring these things together in a more holistic understanding of certain issues like environmental crises. So let me just very briefly go into that. How my very basically how I've sort of built up some of my work in relation to that. Um, when I started studying transforms and conservation areas in Southern Africa in 2002, I think, yeah, 2002, so almost 20 years ago, um, I was sort of advised not to take uh, all these big issues too seriously and just focus on what the people were doing, which, which I did. And I felt a bit, I learned a lot from that, but at the same time, after my first year of field work, I felt, hey, there's something going on here. And that was a bigger sort of, in the end, neoliberalization of, of conservation. So what that entails, entailed was that within contemporary capitalism, um, you know, most uh, egos in power would acknowledge that we have an environmental crisis and they want to do something, about it, but not by acknowledging the actual root causes of that environmental crisis that I think you've already discussed in, in a lot of detail, but rather by commodifying the responses to environmental crisis, by commodifying conservation, uh, by making conservation a market. And that happens in practical ways. So things like payments for ecosystem services. So nature has become a service on the market and you need to pay for those services. So, you, so for bees or for water or for 
healthy soils or for whatever. So then you need to calculate, you know, how those things translate to products. It's all pretty complicated, and I don't think it is actually possible. But that's how a lot of policies have been developed over the last 20 years. So basically, a capitalist response to a capitalist problem, which I think is kind of futile. Um, but there's also a very interesting and more uh, deeper radical element there is how do you translate nature into capital, right? Translating people into capital is really very hard. Most people don't feel, even though they're called human resources in most organizations, don't feel really happy with that. But translating nature into capital actually means that you have to bring the non-use of nature into capital circulation. What that entails is a use of nature in capital circulation is quite easy. I mean, for example, you chop down a tree, you make it into a piece of furniture, and it's very clear how nature then translates into a product that can be bought and sold on the market. But how do you do the same thing with the non-use of nature? How do you actually commodify and trade something that you leave alone? And again, that's where that idea of service becomes really interesting. So that then you translate the services that you get from nature. And in that process, a lot of assumptions are made in order to allow international markets and financial institutions to trade in these kind of services uh, or carbon credits and, and those kind of things that I would argue and a lot of argue, others argue amounts to an absolute fundamental contradiction. Right? A contradiction on, on, on absolutely the most fundamental level namely that you take it apart as, as you do with the commodification processes. You put boundaries around all kinds of things so that they can be commodified and then you bring them back together in a trade process that allows these kind of ecosystem and human nature interactions to function more efficiently according to markets. So basically this, if I would put it crudely, this is kind of the last step in sort of a capitalist process whereby humans think that, that they are literally becoming God and that their idea about you know, value creation can, be, can become the way in which literally all of life is supposed to be managed. I won't go, I mean, let me, let me leave it at that. I mean, I, I think that that's, that, that's a fundamental, a crude and a, a horrible contradiction that will simply never work to actually uh, solve the environmental problem. It will only make it worse. What do you do in response to that? Now, that's been a big question for me over the last five years uh, or six years or whatever. It's always, been, it's always been on my mind, but I simply didn't feel I, I was ready yet or had enough confidence yet uh, and understood these kind of complex processes enough in order to actually come you know, with some ideas about the way forward. Um, and I still feel a little bit uncomfortable with them because the last thing I think the world needs at this point is a bunch of you know, white men from Europe telling um, how, uh, how we should go forward with these kind of problems. Uh, traditionally, it's, you know, again, when you look at positionalities, context and history, it's especially white men um, who have traditionally done that and uh, look, look where it got us. Uh, still, I hope some of us can still play some kind of role in that together with others and that's how, I, that's how I would approach this and, and how I've approached the whole uh, issue. There's my daughter. Hey, Irana. I'm going to okay? Um, so what, what we've done together with others is to think about, okay, so if this is a fundamental contradiction in terms of conservation, how do you take a step towards a post-capitalist conservation? And, and we published a, a book called the conservation revolution, where we try to sort of very logically go into basically the things that I've just laid out. What is the history of the relation between capitalism and, and nature and how did it lead to conservation? How does that lead to a very fundamental contradiction um, that I laid out? But I'm now thinking I could put it even more, even more, sim even more straightforwardly, I think, in that exactly the time that conservation has grown to become a really prominent global sector is exactly the time when the environmental crisis has also grown. 
i.e. before conservation, we did not have a global environmental crisis. And hence, the fact that we have conservation as we know it is related to the fact that we have the environmental crisis as we know it. And hence, the two are, inter, you know, are both part of the problem rather than the solution. That doesn't mean that everything is bad in, in, in conservation and all the people are bad and all that. But it does mean we need a fundamentally different way forward. That means a lot of different things that I won't go into, but maybe just for this discussion, it means rethinking economics, right? To really bring the politics in, to really bring history, positionality, and context in. I think that's absolutely crucial. And hence also lived experience and positionalities from others, from other voices that we don't know and we, that, that, that we don't hear from enough. Um, so I think all of you have an incredibly important role to play uh, in, in those discussions. And secondly, to actually try to imagine new ways forward, to try to imagine another type of conservation that goes beyond human nature culture, the uh, sort of human nature dichotomies, beyond alienation, that doesn't just appreciate nature as a spectacle, but also more everyday mundane type of natures. And that integrates how we deal with nature fully into our economy, rather as some kind of sector on the side that is supposed to mediate the, the, the harmful impacts that the general economy continues to have. Um, I can say a lot more about that, but I will not, because I think I've already taken too much time. So I will leave it at that and just look forward to the discussion. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Bram. That was, that was wonderful. I took so many notes. I was like frantically writing everything down because there was just so much there. Um, and I think what's really great is, um, and I hope that we're going to have a lot of time today for, for some conversations and questions. So hopefully we can pick up some of those things. I also think that where you ended off about both uh, like the importance of, of lived experience and listening to people's experiences and integrating that, as well as like imagining different ways is going to lead us very well into Kia's presentation and the kind of work that she does and the people that she, that she works with. So I think that that's a really great uh, segue. Um, Kia, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Great, thank you. So just introduce yourself uh, to everyone a little bit, say what you do and then take it away. Cool. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Gia Makhajusipato or Gia and I am based at the Alternative Information and Development Center in Cape Town and I work around alternatives to extractivism and climate change, um, focusing on, of course, amongst other things, unfolding a campaign or regional campaign to dismantle corporate power. And um, I'm very excited to be able to talk to, to you today and to be able to engage, to be able to look at particular stuff. I, I think for my part now is that I took everything a little bit backwards and sort of harbored on the point around power imbalances. And I think um, the great speakers in the beginning or the opening plenary really spoke about it and i think for for me that most importantly it's about um the the how power lies in the hands of a few and and, and that few own of course the means of production and rely on the market to sell goods so i'm kind of sort of gonna go um i'm kind of gonna go then and take it from there and then get on to the point around those that we work with and really looking at the lived experience of people and kind of how it speaks to um, where we are today. So basically then the few that don't produce for their consumption, um, but for the consumption of um, the market, right? Um, those are the ones that I'm talking about. And, and I'm going to be stressing that consumption for the, the market element is the reason why there's overproduction and, there's a create, and it creates the conditions for overconsumption and waste. So this arbitrary thing called the market determines what, what needs to be produced and consumed. So basically the continuous tango between production and consumption puts pressure on nature and people. The pressure exerted is considered of course as a externality. Well, in pop culture terms, it's considered as an L or a loss that nature and people must take, right? So here within lies 
the problem, right? Economics thinks that nature and people and labor is the gift that keeps on giving with no exhaustibility. So there are, of course, some economists that look at supply, demand, and the allocation of the Earth's resources and try to create um, a sustainable relationship between the three. However, we are yet to see that, right? The current paradigm we exist in is where nature and people are outside of the production and consumption tango and can therefore be exploited by any means necessary for the tango to continue and profits to be made. I think um, you alluded to the conversations that happened yesterday around people being alienated from from nature. And I was talking about the alienation from nature helps us then to what I'd call othering nature. And because we other it, it's simple to use it as a tool to get what we need and not consider the, the, the implications of it, right? So the extraction and exploitation that takes place for the benefit of the few, right? This is where the power imbalances um, lie. And this is where many of my colleagues and myself come in, right? So the struggles that we're a part of challenge and seek to dismantle the power asymmetry created by the global economic system. The power asymmetry, which places profit at the forefront of everything, right? There are different players in this game. But for our focus is what Professor um, Leon spoke about, which he called stateless enterprises. And, and, and one of our other focuses is the drive to curb government interventions and public spending with, of course, the growth of the private sector. So in our context, stateless enterprises or rather transnational corporations are involved in the destruction, disruption, the destruction and disruption of nature, shrinking tax bases, evading wages and violating human rights. To be concrete, the sustained destruction and disruption of nature gives us the current ecological crisis we are facing and more immediate the climate crisis, which at the present moment gave us in Southern Africa droughts and Cyclone Idaya. For me to know that Cyclone Idaya ravaged Mozambique a lot actually. And um, a couple of years ago, we were about to have day zero in Cape Town. And technically in South Africa, we've had a six year long sustained drought. So in countries like South Africa, mining has led to the deep environmental degradation to the point where old mining towns in Bumalanga have sinkholes and there's fires underground, literally. In the Val or the East Rand, we see large mine dumps that poison the air and affect the respiratory systems of people that live close by. The continued tango between production and consumption is an incentive not to spend money on mining rehabilitation. Rehabilitating the environment is an obscene cost for profit makers. So families are displaced from their land and homes so mining can take place. People are killed and beaten so mining can take place. Communities are denied water so mining can take place. Food systems are disrupted so big agrochemical companies can make money. Seeds are genetically modified so companies like Monsanto or Bayer can make money from patents, of course. These seeds the, or these genetically modified seeds usurp the space of indigenous seeds, usurp the space of indigenous knowledge, right? Hold small scale farmers and peasants hostage. So as I mentioned earlier, the struggles we're a part of are about dismantling the power symmetry. We see affected communities and people saying no. Affected communities who are fighting against extractivism and the current development paradigm that's been driven by the current global economic system. Communities are determining what kind of models that they want to live under, right? They're, they're determining and creating and putting forth models that respect the symbiotic relationship between people and nature. So basically, through some of the work that I'm doing and those that I'm engaging with, we see small scale farmers 
um, in Zambia who are fighting against Parmalat. And let's not forget, Parmalat, the one that gives us our yogurt, the one that gives us our cheese, right? The one that literally came into South Africa, dismantled the dairy system in South Africa, and now big dairy in South Africa that used to exist doesn't exist anymore. We only have like a few little companies, but Parmalat is a giant. You've got smallholder farmers in Zambia fighting against Parmalat for doing the very same thing in Zambia, usurping the dairy system and pushing and killing their livestock and their means to be able to put food on the table. We have mining affected communities in South Africa or in anywhere else actually on the African continent fighting against Glencore and Anglo American. An interesting fact is that technically Glencore is no longer a mining company. Glencore is what you would consider a commodities trader. Glencore is so big that it has smaller mining companies in different countries which are doing it, the extraction for it. And then Glencore then sells these commodities, right? We see fisher folks in the Democratic Republic of Congo fighting against the construction of the Inga 3 Dam, right? The Inga 3 Dam is supposed to produce power for the mining industry in the Democratic Republic of Congo and also produce power for South Africa. Now, this is the most ludicrous and obscene project ever where mining in the, where power, hydroelectric power from the DRC needs to miraculously fly all the way to South Africa and give power or electricity to South Africa. Carolee mentioned earlier that you have access to Women Hold Up the Sky, which is a film around actually um, particular struggles by women in particular areas on the African continent. And one of the struggles that Zoom ends to is the Fisher folks in the DRC and how they're challenging their government um, in terms of the construction of the Inga 3 Dam. Right, But what we're also seeing is that these struggles are not defensive struggles only. So we're not just saying no, right? Communities and affected people are putting on the table alternatives. So they're saying that we don't, we're saying no to a particular way of life, but we're saying yes to what the way we live, right? So we, we're seeing comrades and people demand climate jobs. They're demanding jobs that are going to directly help us slash our greenhouse emissions, right? We're getting communities that are saying, we're saying yes to ecotourism. Please come to the wild coast in South Africa. Please come and enjoy nature, right? But it doesn't ha have to include mining at all, right? So all of these alternatives being put forth by affected people are about actually changing economics and rather or rather pushing for alternatives that seek to technically break the tango between production and consumption and perpetuate and strengthen the symbiotic relationship between nature and people. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. That was so great. That was wonderful. Um, so, uh, Kyla's asked you to share where you work uh, again, um, which, so Kia works at AIDC in Cape Town, um, and Kia, can you remind me what are the programs that you work on at AIDC? So I, I work on a program um, called, it's a mouthful, it's called Alternatives to Extractivism and Climate Change. So we try to get to the nexus of power and saying that we're putting forth alternatives to extracting and we're also trying to tackle um, the climate crisis. And one of the big campaigns that we're engaging in is the Southern African campaign to this mental corporate power, which heard different cases from around the Southern African region by affected communities against transnational corporations. So we literally spent three years researching and delving into deep how human rights violations look like at the hands of big corporations. Great. So um, I'd really like us to open this up uh, for, for questions. Does anyone have, there were a couple of um, 
There were a couple of ones as we were going in the chat, but I, does anyone want to raise their hand or else just unmute themselves and, um, and ask a question or make a comment? I think there was so much, uh, even if you don't have a specific question um, about, I'm not sure who is unmuted, I'll try to figure it out. Um, or oh, Alice, or someone can try to figure it out. Um, uh, if, if, if you wanna just unmute yourself and say uh, something that this presentation sparked uh, for you, I think that would also be great. Gabriel, please. Um, cool, uh, so I just wanted to say that, um, it's not, not really a question, but I just wanna say thank you for that um, presentation. I think it, it, uh, it really did emphasize not only what we, we see in everyday life, by the fact that um, c communities know what we want, um, are empowered, <laughs> but sometimes uh, the, the case is that uh, we lack resources um, to one, enact that, um, that action that we know will work in our communities, but two, uh, resources to push back against bigger um, entities that would push their own agenda. Um, and so I really do, I really do. Th thank you for, for sharing. And uh, yeah, it's very insightful. Thank you, Gabriel. Does anyone else have any questions? If you're feeling shy, you Hello? can put them in the chat. Yes. Yebo, Yebo, how are you doing? Good, good. Who is speaking? I can't see who's speaking. My name is Sandile, Sandile, Sandile. Sandile, yes. I've made many great comments in the chat. Take hey, it away. Kerele, Kerele, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm yeah, good. Good, Thank good. You. Take good. it away. Yeah, fantastic. Kia, yeah, Kia, yeah, this was a fantastic, passionate um, presentation. Uh, one of these, you know, one of the ironies of what we are saying today is that, you know, as far back as the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, uh, you know, with uh, the Safe St. Lucia campaign and others, the kind of issues you are raising, uh, you know, uh, you know, could have been raised even sharper because it looks like we have not been listening all along. Uh, it looks like uh, the voices of the poor, the marginalized continue uh, to be violated. It's even worse in a country like ours, where in fact, I think uh, corporates are, are not being held accountable enough, uh, so much that they are messing up here and they're even moving to other borders. So it's a new kind of violent colonialism uh, that is creeped in and, and, and uh, presentations like yours give us hope uh, that there is direction, uh, there is legitimacy uh, for people on the ground uh, to fight, uh, you know, you know, you know, against these forces. So, so I thank you for that, Kia. Kia uh, Thank you, Sandile. Um, so there was to, again keep keep those questions and put your hand up if you have anything else to say. But Bram, there was a question earlier during your presentation uh, that was asking: Was conservation not a response to the environmental crisis? Uh, and I, maybe you'd like to say a little bit more about that. Um, yes, it, yes, it was. Um, but at the same time, I would argue not a response that uh, tackled the structural causes of uh, of environmental crisis. So it, it was. It was. So I would call it the capitalist response to to a capitalist problem, right? So it was in, in, in um, my, my screen has frozen. Can you still hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Um, so, I mean, so this, this, this for me has been one of the main surprises in my own research over the last yeah, 15, 20 years or so to, to, to have come to consider mainstream conservation not as the solution, but as part of the problem. Um, and it's gone basically from bad to worse, which is not to say that, again, everybody in conservation is, is bad. Uh, not, not at all. Most people in conservation are very passionate and, and, and try to work hard. But, but, but the structural position of conservation in, in, in global history, they don't often acknowledge and or even really understand. Uh, and that is precisely from uh, what what several uh, here have already have already mentioned, right? The early start, and I think that, that that's what you discussed yesterday. The early start in the industrial revolution in uh, in England and the, the enclosure movement, um, etc., whereby conservation 
right, was a response to environmental degradation. And it, it has been effective in many ways to save uh, species and ecosystems. So that for me is not necessarily the point. It, it's not that it's not been effective. It's been effective in, 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 in a particular, in a very particular way to save certain species and certain ecosystems from impending destruction, et cetera. Um, but it's never really uh, challenged the system from, you know, from, from within it, which it came and within which it became necessary. And that is now kind of happening, I think, um, not for the first time, because uh, that would be silly. I mean, so if you look at indigenous ways of looking and relation, relating to nature, you could call that conservation, you know, perhaps much more <laughs> than, than the conservation sector or the, or the, the current conservation movement. Um, so this is not necessarily new, but uh, what I do believe is, is currently happening and what I find interesting is that a lot of people from within the conservation movement and sector or conservation biologists are finding it harder and harder to deal with the fact that conservation is becoming bigger, more money is going to conservation, there are more protected areas in the world than ever before, and yet the environmental crisis is deepening, extending, and growing. And that kind of, you know, cognitive dissonance of, at some point, I mean, you know, even staunch conservationists uh, will need to accept that, 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 you know, these kind of things are not structurally making any difference. And hence you need a more structural, structural approach. And that basically means a totally different way of looking at conservation. And that, I mean, that's, I, I would just leave it at that. But that, that's how I would view both how conservation has been in response to the crisis, but it has not really tackled the root causes. Great, thank you so much. Gabriel, your hand is up. I'm not sure if that's from before. Um, um, it's, it's, it's for now. Um, no, great, okay, take, take it away. Um, I just wanted to check with Ram, um, because you were saying a lot, and so I just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, so is, is it, in a very layman's, very, very layman's terms, is it uh, every morning you get up and you bump your foot on the table and you, know, you put a plaster on the foot, you put a plaster on the foot, you put a plaster on the foot. But one day you need to move the table so that you stop bumping your foot. Is that in yeah. essence what it is? Is changing the system so that you don't keep repeating, you know, having to use plasters, which is conservation, but rather exactly. moving it so that you don't have to do the plaster situation every day. Exactly, exactly. Oh. Spot on. You know, it's like putting, you know, plasters on a wound that keeps growing bigger and bigger. That's exactly it. It's not a fundamental solution it's just a plaster yeah exactly right i think that's just such a great uh, metaphor gabriel and it also um i think it also highlights you know it's so important when you're learning together for people to also like restate what they understand in a different way because i think that also helps everyone to to like deepen their learning and make sure that they're all on the same page so i think that's great thank you uh bruce i see that your hand is up would you like to come in I would, I would. Um, yeah, thanks, Kia and Bram. Um, sorry, hold on. Thanks, Kia and Bram. I think you guys now probably know which organization you need to come work for when you're done with your studies. Uh, the AIDC clearly re representing. Um, I just wanted to add a comment to what Bram was saying about ecosystem services and then a, um, and then a question. So, you know, with the absurdity of ecosystem services as this uh, kind of capitalist fix to a capitalist problem. Um, I did my masters in conservation and we have kind of uh, environmental economists who kind of teach this stuff came and lectured us. And one of the things which kind of shows the absurdity of this is if you try to put a value on a, on a forest in some way to kind of conserve it and you can show that, um, you know, if you protect this forest over 10 years, it's going to create value by kind of purifying the water or all these kind of things they try and quantify. Um, it's quite, quite easy for whoever wants to develop the forest to say, okay, well, if we cut it all down and make a short-term profit, which might not be as much as the long-term profit, 
we can simply invest that short-term profit um, onto the market, into stocks, even a low risk uh, kind of account can generate more interest. Um, so it's, it's so often that even if you can quantify nature, there's going to be a way that you can um, add a higher value uh, through its exploitation. And then to Brahm, um, so I think, and I imagine most of the people here would kind of agree that the, there's a systemic problem uh, conservation has not addressed that. It's often exacerbated it. Um, but now that we know what the, that the issue is systemic and that conservation needs to change, and given that it is a crisis of capitalism, what are the kind of politics and what are the kind of strategies that conservationists need to take to kind of build an anti-capitalist uh, conservation uh, politics? And what are the kind of social forces they need to link up with how do they do that? Um, I'm interested in that kind of um, kind of thinking strategically now. Um, what do we need to do? Thank you. Shall I shall I briefly respond to them? Yes, please. That'll be great. Well, thank you, Bruce, and, and really good to see you again. Um, there's no short answer to that question. <laughs> I mean, we took three years to write a book. So, um, you know. Speculate. <laughs> and and I, I, can, I can rehearse some of, some of, some of the things um, if people are interested. But I, I think maybe for the discussion, um, you specifically referred to a politics, right? And so I think maybe, I think two things here that I could bring in and I would, I would love to hear other people's thoughts on are the following. Uh, first of all, as you, as you said, conservation has often been seen as something separate, right? Something innately good, helping, you know, to build these wonderful plasters, right? That, that look very green and that, you know, are, are filled with beautiful animals and all that kind of stuff, but don't actually link it with, with other movements and other, other issues, right? Like, like he has said, labor issues, consumption issues, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. So it, it has to be intersectional in, 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 in many different uh, ways. So that, that's, that's the first element, I think, of that, that kind of politics. The second element is to, to do, is, is to really sort of think strategically about the kind of political interventions and the kind of political discourses that, that, that go with that. So we have tried to, build up a discourse around what we started calling convivial conservation based on ideas around conviviality living together living well um, to counter other forms of you know conservation discourse to really put a, a very different conservation discourse on the table right that doesn't blame people that doesn't see money as the solution but really moves beyond that and in that and i think also within broader intersectional kind of movements that bring different kind of struggles together, it's always a question of, of highlighting certain key political elements that you, that, 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 that you want to uh, use in order to create some kind of wedge in the system and also bring other people on board. Because tackling the, the thing as a whole, for most people, is just I mean, okay, for me, I mean, that's mind blowing, right? That, that, that's so big. You need to also start somewhere, right? And, and this is sometimes where intersectionality gets lost in the fact that it always wants to do everything and bring everything together. Um, actual politics, and in, and in fact, why neoliberals have been so successful is that they will focus on all kinds of different elements very specifically and highlight those issues within different realms. But across those are several um, several political principles that that you hold on to together, and I think for a post capitalist politics, I mean, some of these things are very very you know clear. Like like you've already said, I mean, I think the degrowth movement uh, in the global south and in the global north anywhere is already making those kind of kind of connections. I think, but cutting to the heart of the of the issue that we need to deal with with economic growth and hence rethinking as he also argued i think very very forcefully and 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 and, and insightfully 
different ways of, of dealing with production and consumption issues. Conservation needs to be part and parcel of that, right? So you need to not posit, you must posit it not as something outside of developmental issues, economic issues, but rather directly in, in, in relation uh, to that. So we have thought about three different particular kind of dimensions that, that, that we, we feel are, you know, like interesting starting points. On, a, on an actual landscape level, so thinking about landscape designs and how you can create spaces for non-human others, but also for people to live in various ways. I mean, in India, people are doing this in, in other places as well. I think we can learn from this uh, and, and, and try to scale those things up. Second, uh, finances, how to finance conservation differently, not by appealing for corporate support, but by pushing to become to for, 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 for you know, different human nature relations to become part and parcel of public budgets, of, uh, of, um, of employment schemes, of, 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 of other things. And thirdly, and one of the things we suggested in, in relation to conservation, for example, is a conservation basic income scheme. So in relation to, you know, to, to a broader basic income scheme, but also then relate that to environmental issues and how to, you know, get other voices into the conservation sphere. And, and thirdly, uh, how to organize conservation more democratically. So to not focus, because there's, there's been this um, community-based conservation um, turn that in all kinds of ways was, was very, I think, uh, influential, particularly in Southern Africa. And what it did was to really sort of highlight the importance of bringing con uh, communities into conservation. And I still, I mean, I still think that that's utterly important. But the, the, the problem of that was, with hindsight, I think, mostly, is that you also responsabilize local people living next to conservation spaces for the problems of, of biodiversity loss and, 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 and environmental crisis. Whereas the biggest problem is with the rich, with people from the global north, with those who have the biggest footprints. And so that's what I mean with democratizing, not just in terms of getting other people's voices in, but also connecting different footprints to each other and putting responsibility where responsibility should be, should be put. You know, so, so you bring in people that haven't had their voice heard on the one hand, but don't responsabilize them in a way uh, to make it seem as they need to change their lives to let non-human animals live. No, others also, the rich must change their lives. And so those kind of, that could be sort of part of the politics, I would imagine that a conservation, convivial conservation could, could um, promote in the, um, in the future. Great, thanks, Bram. I think that was a great, like, excellent, excellent answer. And I was wondering if Kia wanted to come in there um, talking about also answering Bruce's question about what kind of politics we need to advance, because I think that speaks to a lot of, a lot of her, her work. And again, guys, we can keep the conversation going a little bit longer because I think it's very rich. Um, so Kia, would you like to come in? And feel free, anyone else, to pop any points in the chat or raise your hand. Cool, thanks. I think um, Bruce's question is a huge one. Um, and I mean, I, 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 for me, the kind of politics that we're needing to be practicing right now is actually um, a politics of reimagining what the world is going to look like. So thinking about, re like concretely thinking about where to now and how this way to is going to look like. I think we spend a little bit of a considerable amount of time really debunking and unpacking what's wrong with the current system, which is necessary. But I also think we need to take a lot of our energies in reimagining a different world and laying the foundations for it. I think with a lot of the, the, the people and the comrades that I work with and spend a considerable amount of time with is that it's very clear that people inherently know through their lived experiences the kind of world that they want to live in and some of them are practicing it but the current system either comes and crushes it or says that it's not correct so i think we we we, we really need to figure out that what does it mean when we when we're living and coexisting with each other what does it mean to have things in relation to a well-being um sort of economy and really question issues around of course 
over um, 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 consumption. And what I mean about questioning issues of overconsumption or even overproduction is that, do we really need the same item 10 times? Do we really need to take part in particular things the same time over and over again? Are we okay with one thing? And, and, and question why, why has it been ingrained in our psyche that I need a new phone every two years or so? I think once we start having those kind of conversations is when we start thinking about those different types of politics and also designing a different way of life. Thank you. Thank you, Kia. That was that was great. I think that that one of the one of the things it made me think about. So I think reimagining is is incredibly incredibly important. And um, and I think one of the things that neoliberalism does is is try to limit our imagination. Right. It tries to make us um, think that this is how the world is. And you know that's the whole the the Fukuyama end of history thing. Right. That's been proven to be very, very wrong. Um, and I think this links up with a lot of question, a lot of comments that we had yesterday about people saying, you know, um, we don't want to go back to normal, right? That a lot of people have said in the COVID moment that, that things are really like, things are really awful and we're tired of things being the way that they are. But a lot of people have pointed out, you know, things were not very good for most people before this. Um, and so I, I think I said this to everyone yesterday, the name of one of the reports that my colleague and I did was entitled like No Going Back to Normal, um, like imagining a just recovery for South Africa, because that's what we're really trying to do. And while you were talking here, it made me think about the, um, the, the, the climate camp that you guys have now all heard about that we did, that Bruce and I did last year. Um, and um, we, one of the things we got the, the, the students, like the, the, the high school kids to do, right, was to think about, um, to like brainstorm all these different things we can do. And one of the things that my group came up with was they said, oh, we should have a mall to fix things. And so they said, you know, all these things break and then we don't know how to get them fixed and then we just go and buy new things. And they're like, why don't we have like a mall of fixing things where all these like small people can sit and have their shop and someone fixes iPhones and someone fixes like uh, your shirt and someone fixes your shoes. And it's such a small thing, but I was like, that's really cool. Like a mall to fix things is really great. Um, and I think that like having these kinds of conversations and opening people's minds is really, really um, important. And all of these things are, are linked and we, we, we need to um, like tell people, you know, that, that, that the, there, are, there are different possibilities if we make different choices and if we imagine different, different choices. Um, does anyone else want to come in with some comments some questions? Uh, a one there, there, I see your hand is, your hand is up. Um, so if you'd like to ask your question. Thank you, Carrie Lee. Um, it's, it's more of a comment now. Um, I, I think Bram covered most of it, but Kia raised a very um, relevant point, which I think is something that needs to be echoed. Um, and I hope is being echoed across all the other streams and in every other session with regards to thinking more intentionally with regards to the alternatives and the solutions to these, these crises that we are so um, you know, uh, familiar with in, in, in such spaces. Um, and I think something that Ram also said that kind of touched on me was this, this concept of convivial uh, conservation. Because for me, uh, conservation, I grew up in an area near the Kruger Park. So um, in school, ideas of conservation and, and how we relate to nature were drilled into us um, in, in a way in which I'm only beginning to reinterrogate now as I'm older. Um, but conservation has always seemed as such a defensive, um, uh, a defensive, was called again, action to me with regards to we just trying to preserve what little is left as it's being chipped away more and more. Um, and now being introduced to this concept of uh, convivial conservation and, you know, other... Um, ideas of deep growth, climate justice, and radical eco ecology that fit in with that. Um, I'm just um, kind of curious also with regards to if we can reach a point where conservation is something that we no longer speak of because we are moving into a, a you know, maybe a field of regeneration 
um, ways where we're not learning to um, live with nature, but ways in which we are more greatly integrating nature into our everyday lives, increasing uh, the amount of, of, of um, interaction um, and, and space that, that is left for, you know, nature to, 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 to be. Uh, particularly uh, in our continent, because it still has, I mean, compared to the, the global north, there is still that kind of room, but at the same time, uh, due to our ambitions of economic development, that window and what is left and what has to be conserved is shrinking and shrinking um, very fast. Uh, sorry, that wasn't a question, that was just a comment. No, thanks, Awande. I think that was great. And I think um, it speaks to some of the things we were talking about yesterday. I think this was a discussion partly verbally and partly in the chat about like uh, understanding ourselves not being separate from nature, right? And also about the, the idea of, you know, um, people becoming alienated from nature, especially when people live in, 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 in particular in urban poverty, right? Um, and, and, not, and not having that kind of connection to what we typically think of as nature, um, which I think is, is really great. I don't know if Ram or Kia would like to, um, to comment on any of that. We have a couple more minutes before we need to close. So I don't know if, um, if anyone wants to come in and make any comments on that. Uh, Kelly, can I can I yes. just come in because I think Awande hit something for me uh, in relation to the whole conversation around economic growth or or even um, development, you know, and and a lot of the things that we're seeing, in particular in the African continent, is is um, people wanting to de-link from the quintessential understandings of the current development paradigm because the current development paradigm is an extractive one for the African continent, right? So we're here to take so we can create somewhere else and then those who can um, consume in the African continent can then buy it back. So I think, I think, I think we're, we're needing to really ask ourselves the deep and serious questions about what is this development? You know, and what are we actually trying to move towards? Because I think there's there's many communities, groups of people, whether even urban or even in rural um, areas, who are living who are living within in with nature thoroughly and properly, and 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 are taking and putting back so seamlessly that some of sort of the I guess sometimes the ludicrous things of conserving and keeping things the way they are seem a little bit wild and unnecessary so i think i think there's there's this there's, there's, there's a lot of i think there's a lot of energy and time that we need to be spending and asking ourselves about these 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 things and these notions that are put forth that are this is the way life is this is the way development needs to look like that we're going to need to backtrack and really and and unpack and unfold i mean there's a grouping that we work with who have been fighting against any form of mining to start um, in their area for the past 10 years. And we're told that mining brings development and they're like, but like what kind when it's going to bring environmental degradation? So it's great, you guys can mine titanium that is going to go into either, um, uh, um, you know, the development of golf clubs for those people that play golf clubs and whatever titanium does. Um, but but what it's going to do to our community and our way of life is going to ravage it, right? So then it's, it's, it begs the question of development for who and for what means. And I think particularly in this, um, in this current time and in the African context, we really need to start moving towards what some people would say, um, another concept around delinking from the global systems or deglobalization, but much more I think delinking from archaic notions of what development is. Awesome, thank you, Kia. Ram, do you have any, any final um, thoughts that you'd like to share with us? I just want to kind of reiterate what, what, what Kia and Amanda were, were just saying. I think those are, those are absolutely brilliant comments. Um, uh, also, from, from my perspective here at, at, at the Northern University, I think development is really in need of an overhaul. Um, there has been a post-development um, literature movement, of course, that is already doing this. But I think 
it needs an, another couple of steps. And I think, I mean, all of you, your voices are going to be absolutely crucial in that. So that 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 is just to 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 reiterate what what Kia has said. Uh, but also, I want this point: how um, how conservation is a is generally a conservative movement that tries to keep certain things into place is is so it's really spot on i think um you know it, all things need to change but then somehow somehow these things need to need to sort of stay the same but they also mean that that certain power dynamics you know stay the same and that's exactly what we need to question and and, and conservation is really in bed with with big power so i think from that comment that i want to make i i would say comes a whole lot of next 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 step issues on how to then reimagine reimagine all those relationships and again i would just i would just like to encourage i wonder and others to to start really raising those in strategic ways with others and, and there's also an invitation literally like like let's keep, uh, stay in touch to to strengthen those kind of you know relationships with each other in order to push these kind of things harder uh, in the political fight that 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 many of us are in, in in different ways so thank you awesome thank you thanks Bram and I'll I'll, uh, I'll close shortly but we've just had another request from Swazi to ask Kia a question yeah exactly Kia's right that's never too late um, so please unmute yourself and ask away Hi, everybody. Um, so thank you very, very much for those very rich and very insightful conversations. I think they're so important and I wish there were more people to, you know, be part of this. Um, and Kia, your presentation really made me reflect on my own uh, research somehow. And, um, and I know very much that in the extractive industries, there is this big gender issue as well, you know. Um, and as we all know, capitalism subsystems they depend on and they free ride on the social reproductive activities of women, um, which form its background conditions of possibility. Um, and I mean, even with that said, capitalism is always contested. And I just wondered, um, with the women that you work with in your research, if you do work with any women, what specifically are the types of things that have stood out for you in terms of how they're imagining these alternatives? Um, and yeah, like, what are they doing? What are these alternatives that they, that you have seen? And um, yeah, what did you take from that? Can I jump in, Carly? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, thanks, Ozzy, for that question. It's actually an exciting one. Um, just to say that 95% of the groupings that I work with are actually women. Um, and we have this running joke, particularly with um, lawyers, that if there's a court case that we prefer women to sign um, the affidavits and whatnot because they never change their mind. Men do, because they can be bought over with a car or something. So <laughs> uh, I think, I think, I think um, the women who are at the forefront of extractive struggles are very, very clear in protecting their ways of life. And they can articulate it clearly and let you know that we've been living um, for years on this particular piece of land and we've been doing it for so long. Who are you to come? I have comrades from Ghana who say, and there's, there's always issues between Southern Africa and North and Central Africa, but there's comrades from Ghana who say that Ghanaians have been mining gold for years and all of a sudden now extractivism is an issue. Um, it's because it's not done right. So, so, so I think um, if you like, we can continue this chat offline, and I can regale you with like a lot more stories of how of how women are extremely inspiring and are very clear around the alternatives. But I think, and and this is something that I made earlier in my presentation about the the exploitation of nature is similarly for me the, with the exploitation of, of of women's labor that women have been othered. Um, um, in, in terms of the, 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 the capitalist system, so it's easier to exploit. So I always think, and I look at the exploitation of nature similarly to women's labor too. But um, we can talk offline if you like. Thanks. Thanks, Kia. And I think as you were saying that, I, I thought the same thing. The way in which like the kind of labor that, that 
typically women do in the economy has been made invisible by the way in which our, our economy uh, functions or the things we value in our economic system is the same way in which the work that nature does becomes invisible. And that goes back to some of our conversations we had yesterday about GDP and what counts, right? What counts when you're, when you're measuring an economy? What counts, it, it's typically not the kind of social reproductive work that women do, and it's not the work that nature does. And I think that these things are like really, really important um, because uh, it speaks to what we value and, and how we understand all these things. And I think there's really amazing writing and really amazing work, um, activist work being done around these issues. So I hope we can kind of keep that conversation going. Which brings me to the kind of final point that we're going to have to close the session now and our next session at 2.30 is a plenary. Um, so I think if someone can just, uh, Alice or, or Nsako Tseko can just post the link to that in the chat. You guys should all have that in your resource packs um, and all that, but we're going to have a plenary session with the other streams. I mean, I think it's going to be really great and really, uh, really um, helpful. We've got some wonderful speakers in that as well. Um, but this will be the last time we meet as a group. And I want to just say from my side that I've really, really enjoyed these conversations. Uh, everyone has had so many wonderful insights and it's been so great to be with all of you. And I really hope, you know, it would have been so, uh, as we've said many times, we hope we would all be together physically um, but we have only been together virtually and I hope that that doesn't mean we won't kind of keep these connections going. Um, if you are a student and you're on the group um, please get involved in the REFA chapter at your university. You can email us about that. Um, if you're not, if you're if you're a lecturer, it's also you can also be involved in Refer. We have some sort of academic convenings that we've been trying to get going. Um, and if you just want to, you know, keep keep chatting to us, uh, you all have uh, my email and my cell phone number. Please feel free to drop me a line about any of these things, any of this work. Um, and I think the same goes for any of the other Refer groups. So I really hope that we can keep in touch and we can keep going. And any ideas you have around how we do that um, will be really helpful. Um, and hopefully we can have some more conversations like this uh, really soon. Um, and I think with that, uh, we will probably close. Uh, feel free to, um, so there's the closing plenary. I hope I'm gonna see you all there for it. Um, and I'd like to say thank you so much to Brahman and Kia. Those were just really, really wonderful insights. I think it was such great conversation. Um, and really rich and I'm so happy that we finished the stream on such a positive note. So thank you both for giving up parts of your Saturday to, to do that. And thanks to everyone uh, for joining us. And hopefully next year we'll see everyone in Johannesburg in person and that will be great. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Bye.